Hey, hey, welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm your host, Tom Workus, and today I sit down with Roland Frazier. Roland is the co-founder and or principal of three current Inc. Magazine fastest growing companies, and he's founded, scaled, or sold 24 different seven to nine figure businesses across a range of niches and industries. I connected with Roland at first through a mutual friend, John Corcoran, at a Rise 25 event in Austin, Texas, and ended up getting to spend about really a full day with Roland and definitely a few hours of conversation throughout the day, focused in and around just business in general, the types of projects that he's been involved in, the companies that he's run and growing, and then also taking that and then insights into my business. And so Roland was really great about just providing insights and reflections on it and his thoughts. And one of the things that I came away with just from that conversation was some people are just on, like, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people doing great work, but there's certain people who are just on another level when it comes to the great work that they do. They just kind of get it. Things click at a different level. And he's one of those guys that I think it clicks at a different level. I know part of that is because he was a lawyer. And so he thinks, at least to some degree, he thinks about mergers and acquisitions. He's thinking at that high level. But I think what's so fascinating about Roland and what we talk about today too, we get into this, is he's not just this high level conceptual guy. He actually gets his hands dirty when it comes to these kind of companies and and the projects he's a part of. One of the things we talk about in the conversation was his kind of first foray, I think it was one of his first forays into kind of the internet marketing world and selling digital products, info products in particular. And so he was an affiliate for a very large campaign. And he ended up doing over a million dollars in sales selling an info product during a week long campaign. And so it's not like he came at this with having a huge platform or anything like that. He can think strategically at a high level, and then he can apply it and get his hands dirty and implement. And so my big takeaway from this call was just that you probably have the information you need and you probably know what you need to do. And if you don't, you should probably sit down, clear out a day, write down all the things you know you need to do to be able to achieve the goals that you want, whether it's with a business, a marketing campaign, whatever it might be. Write down every single possible thing you could do to reach that goal, whatever your goal is. That's what Roland did with this uh, affiliate launch. He just wrote down, I think it was a 14-page business plan, basically, of how he's going to market and sell this. It's somebody else's product. It wasn't even his own. And he not only comes up with all these like really interesting ways to market and sell the product, but he actually implements all of them. You know, it's not like here's 20 great ideas, I'm pick one. He actually implemented like all of them. And so he does things like phone sales, like he put his phone number on these websites so that people could call him personally to ask him questions about this product that he was promoting or sharing. And I thought, wow, that's just, and that's as an affiliate. And the bottom line, that's why he was able to generate a million dollars in sales from a single campaign. So again, kind of coming back to that big takeaway, it's you already have the information, you just have to be willing to implement it. And there's two pieces there that I think are, are important to understand. You have the information, you got to get your hands dirty. Two, two thoughts. One is manual is okay. Like it's okay to do things manually. Automation seems like the holy grail, but I think more often than not, people seek or chase automation and it backfires big time. So listen to today's call and hear how Roland kind of rolls things out. A lot of times there, there's no automation at all in what he's doing, at least not at the, the forefront. In that particular campaign, there wasn't much. A lot of it was doing things manually, doing things that, that you could say that some people describe as doing things you cannot scale. And it's still surprisingly effective. And that's like the leg up anyone can have. Like you can have that leg up in your niche or your industry, no matter what you're doing, because you're willing to do the work that most other people aren't. Most people just are not willing to do that hard work of manual labor, of making those sacrifices, even if they can't quote unquote scale. All right. So that's number one. The second thought is that do everything you can to make things as frictionless as possible. This is something that Roland has kind of taught me over time, just as I've watched him do what he's done. And he's brought it up a couple of times. And anyway, a great example of this, but you know, he tries to organize what he does so that it's as frictionless as possible. Like there's as few things that can get in the way of stopping him from doing that thing as possible. And so just one example of this is when Roland did start his, uh, his blog and he started, I believe, like a Facebook live streaming kind of segment to it. it. It was just a phone and he started recording and then he shared it. And that was that. He didn't get wrapped up in editing or production values or any kind of like, you know, scripted, well-planned out editorial calendar, any, anything like that. He just started recording and he started uploading. And that's kind of, I think you see in the work that he does and the businesses that he, he runs and grows. And in today's conversation, you'll see this, that he applies that definitely to what he's doing. But I think that's the thing you should be able to extract from this conversation, I hope, is that try, do what you can to make things as frictionless as possible for you to be able to be successful. There's something you want to do? Okay. What do you need to do it? Now, what are all the things that can get in the way? How do you remove those or get rid of them or make those things not a bottleneck? A lot of times it's in your own head. 
That's what I've, I've discovered. A lot of times, these things are just in your own head. You have your own thoughts about what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, and you think that there are specific ways that you have to do them. And the answer is that's typically not the case. A lot of times, you have a lot of flexibility and you have more than enough to do what you need to do. And the leanest version, we'll say version 1.0 versus 9.0, the version 1.0 is probably ready to go very quickly. And you don't have to think twice about it. You just have to get it out there. And they get used to, to shipping prolifically, ship all the time, create publish, ship, get it out there, get get it out there into the hands of people, and then keep doing that again and again. So those are just two thoughts on what my big takeaway there is, which is you have what you need, you just got to implement it and get after it really. And then to get after it and to do that, make things as frictionless as possible. And it's okay to do things manually. You do not have to automate everything. Okay, so that's a long precursor to this conversation, but I was very excited about this conversation. I think you're going to learn a lot from it. Let me know. Reply in the comments section. Just go to tommorkis.com slash podcast slash Roland dash Frazier. That's R-O-L-A-N-D dash Frazier, F-R-A-S-I-E-R. And leave a comment. Let me know what you think or shoot me an email. And we'll see about ways that I can continue to deliver great content like this for you guys and have these kind of fascinating conversations. So I hope it is helpful. Without further ado, let's get to today's conversation. So Roland, today I want to talk to you about and kind of get inside your brain on how you do how you do deals, how you think about making deals and how you look at business. I think your approach is remarkable. The time I've gotten to spend with you, I was really, really impressed. And so I'm excited to share that with everyone here today. But to give some context, could you let us know kind of a little bit about who you are like and what led you to what you're doing today? Uh, sure. Uh, help me, guide me along because that's a long story. <laughs> Right. So let's just start with what your main focus is right now. And maybe give us a little, some preface in terms of what are some of the things that, that you did leading up to that? Because I know you're involved in digital marketer. You have, your, you have a few things, a few plates that are spinning. So that's why I'd like to kind of hear from you kind of where, where you're at right now. Oh, sure. Yeah. My current focus is really on... Uh, we've got a company called Digital Marketer that I own with uh, Ryan Dice and Perry Belcher and Richard Lindner. And we basically have a certification program and lots of different trainings that that's that's one focus. Another is um, we have a big event called Traffic and Conversion Summit that happens every year. We had about 6,000 people last year. We should have about 7,000 this year. And then we're going to move, I believe, to the convention center. So we're growing that internationally in 2019 as well into um, Asia and Europe. That's a big focus. And my main focus on that event is building sponsors and the kind of the production quality, the AV, the the way the event's going to happen and the logistics side. And then we've got a mastermind called The War Room, which has uh, about 165 members right now. They're typically in the 5 to $85 million range, although we've got maybe 40 or 50 people in the several hundred million and two people over a billion now. So that's kind of fun. And then I have a real estate uh, SaaS company with uh, Kent Clothier, in the real estate investor space. So that's another thing. We have a mastermind there called The Boardroom with about 160 people in it. Uh, and then I have an interest in um, another mastermind group called Closing Table with the guys from Big Block Realty, uh, Sam Karamian and Oliver Graff. And uh, I'm negotiating with them right now to hopefully uh, grab some equity in their companies as well. So that's a that's an ongoing negotiation. And and then I've got a, a lot of different relationships with other people and things that were in the process of working with Brendan Burchard on a deal and Dean Graciosi on a deal and a few other people like that. So that, those are my main things I'm doing right now that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. And and I it just it's honestly it's so many that obviously you didn't even cover all of them, which I think is and these are not small projects. Right? right. I mean, moving into new countries with digital marketer, the way you guys are kind of scaling, growing that is significant. Can you give us a little bit of a background, like how actually that came about? Like that story of you getting in touch with and then joining the digital marketer team. I thought that was a really interesting story the first time I heard it. Yeah, sure. So I, um, when I was long ago, I've been involved in direct response for a long time. I produced a bunch of infomercials with Guthy Rinker and KTEL back in the day. And then when in as, as the internet was coming into being, had channels on CompuServe and online and thing, uh, America Online and things like that, had you know websites. And I was looking for good marketing people. And so in my search, I came across two people early on, three people early on, a guy named Jeff Johnson, a guy named Jeff Walker, who went on to do product launch formula, and then Ryan Dice, who had this... Just trying to remember what the the subscription thing he had was. I can't think of it now, but he came out with a product. I, I really liked his 
approach and his voice. And he came out with a product called Wholesale Traffic System. And they had a guy named Mr. X on it. And it turned out that Mr. X was Perry Belcher, who Ryan had just partnered with. And I'm, I'm thinking this might be 2008 that was going on. And, um, and I bought it and I was just blown away. And on their mailing list, I found out that they were having this event called Traffic and Conversion Summit. It was the very first one. And I went and was just blown away by the content. I, it was, you know, they, there was no, they weren't event guys. So it was just basically a dump of all of the information they knew how to do and not in any terribly organized way, just like raw, great, kick-ass content. And so um, it, it was amazing. I was like, I took more notes, I think, in that than I've ever taken in my life. And it's just like, these guys are amazing. And they offered this, the only thing they offered for sale was this mastermind called The War Room. And uh, it was only 20 people. And it was, I think it was $20,000. And I wasn't sure if I talked to a couple of the guys that were already in, um, they had little black ribbons on. And I, I wasn't sure if it was something I would, get enough out of to make it worth the money at the time. So I, I didn't do anything with it. And then the next year when they had Traffic Conversion Summit, I definitely scheduled myself to go again. And I went with the intention because I was kind of regretting all year long that I didn't join the thing because the people in it seemed really cool. And so I went and right when it opened, I went up to the uh, lady that was operating the, you know, the tables and stuff out front. And I said, Hey, I want to join the war room mastermind. And they were like, Oh, you can't, you can't yet. And I was like, no, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that I want to do it. And she's like, no, we haven't got anything printed for it. We don't have anything like, we literally don't have any of the materials for it. And, and so I attended that with continue to be blown away. And I was just determined I was going to do this. So I ended up joining it. They didn't get the stuff printed until the end. I jo joined it, went to the first meeting. And before I went to the first meeting, I knew that I wanted to I just decided, I, and I've done this multiple times in my life. Uh, I decided I wanted to do business with these guys because they really seemed like they had the right integrity, the right personalities, and and they really knew their stuff. So my intention in joining the mastermind was I wanted to go into business with those guys. And I I had done lots of deals before buying and selling companies, so I felt like if you brought on really really strong marketing people like these guys, like Perry and and Ryan, then um, that would be something I could take into the, the investment banking world of buying companies because it could definitely improve the value. So I knew that I needed to stand out because I, I really wanted to have like a personal uh, conversation with them. And they had this thing called Wicked Smart. And the Wicked Smart is a thing that you bring something to the mastermind that is already working that you've proved that you've got results and then show them how to do it. And then everybody in the mastermind, the 20 people that were members vote and say, you know, this thing was the, was the wicked smart thing that we'll all be able to use in our business. It's really cool. So that was kind of a coveted prize. So when I heard about that, I was like, okay, well, I have to win that because that's going to make, that's going to bring me to the attention of these guys and show them that, you know, that I'm somebody that they should talk to. And so I went in uh, and I kind of was looking at the two or three hottest things that people were trying to accomplish in the day. And I ended up with, with three things that I brought and presented. And uh, I won and Perry came over to me after and said, you know, Hey man, we're having dinner tonight and you got to, you got to sit next to me because I want to talk to you. And so that ended up being the, the beginning of my friendship with Perry. And then I went on and I won almost every one, I think after that, until I couldn't, wasn't allowed anymore because I became an owner. And so it was really you know, a fun way to get noticed and get, you know, get kind of into the flow with those guys. And as I started talking with them, two things happened. One is I'm a recovering accountant and a recovering attorney. So I have lots of experience with companies and buying and selling and working through challenges and things like that. And so I was there to um, give them advice and help them as they went through, you know, different challenges that they faced over about a three year period. Then, uh, trying to think timing wise. And so then uh, in 2010 or 11, 2011, actually, I think it was, I was stuck in Europe and uh, because of the volcano in Iceland erupting, and it may have been 2010, I'm not exactly sure when that happened, but it shut down all the airports. I was on vacation in Italy with my wife and all the airports were shut down. And I just, I told her, I said, well, I said, we've kind of done everything we want to do. And rather than, you know, being at the hotel and doing nothing or going out and doing stuff we don't care about doing anymore. How about if I uh, find something to, you know, to promote 
and try out all this stuff that these guys have been talking about. And I did uh, find something and um, ended up building a, wrote a little business plan about it and sent it to those guys and said, you know, hey, I, one of the things that I'd like to do here is to promote this. Are you guys going to promote it? And they said, they said, oh no. I said, well, if you don't have anything else you're doing at that time, why don't we do it together. I've got all the promos. I've got all the bonuses. You know, I'm going to do all the work and I'm talking with other people to partner on it. And I'll just split the commissions on anything that comes from sales that come, you know, through you guys. And they were like, yeah, okay, that sounds cool. So I promoted with those guys. I think it was either 14 or 16 other people that I did that deal with. And ultimately, it was a little over 30% of my total sales on that launch came through those relationships and probably about 85% of those of that 30 odd percent came from Ryan and Perry. And I ended up selling a million three hundred thousand dollars roughly of stuff over a six day period. And it was at a 50% commission. And then uh, because I was number one, I ended up being number one in the launch. Um, there was a 15% bonus. So I got a 65% commission on the million three ish that I sold. And that was really good in establishing me as a guy that could market also, and not just a business guy, I think. And um, shortly after that, we partnered on a thing called Equity Investors Network, showing people how to buy and sell companies. That was in 2012. We offered it at Traffic and Conversion Summit, sold it. And then shortly after that, there was an opportunity to come into their company. Uh, They had a CEO that had an option to acquire, I think, up to a third of the company. And uh, things didn't work out. So I was able to come in, they said, you know, hey, would you be interested in buying in? And I said, absolutely. And so I bought in and became an equal partner with them in 2013. And over the last five years, it's just been really awesome getting to have a group of people like... uh, And then Richard Linder ended up becoming a partner as well. Having a group of people that really trust you to do what you do is just awesome. So I'm able to shine and do the things that I'm really good at and they're able to shine and do the things they're really good at. And the, this is one of those situations where absolutely the, you know, the group together is worth way more than any individual. It's, yeah, it's pretty wild to me, your breadth of experience. And before all that, you were in the investment banking world, right? Yes. Yeah, I did uh, leverage buyouts with Prudential Securities in New York for several years before that. So it's, I feel like it's a pretty rare combination to have done that, have that experience, move into the digital marketing space, kind of be able to generate some, well, I would say kind of ridiculous results for the time uh, when you did over a million mm-hmm. by just making the right deals and organizing it the right way. It's not like you went and you know started a blog and a podcast and grew your own audience. You were just leveraging other people's... Yeah, I didn't have an audience. So what I did do though was uh, absolutely in terms of leveraging, that is really my key thing that I look for in every situation is if you can find the leverage, you can move the world. I think it was Archimedes or somebody said that, right? Give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. That's correct. And I believe that's so true. So like for there, I literally had no audience. So I had to look at who had traffic. So, well, who has, who has an audience and who has traffic? Who has an audience? All these guys that I made deals with had audiences. And then I, um, you know, Google has an audience and Bing and the other search engines that were, you know, existing at the time. And so I happened to be pretty good at SEO. I like really technical things. My law background was in tax and security. So I really like, you know, complicated puzzles. And so SEO is the non you know the non law version of that. So uh, I SEO'd several blog. I created a blog network. I uh, signed up on fifteen different servers and then had different sites on different IPs pointing to different places. I mean, I, w- I went through the whole. Jeff Johnson has an amazing strategy that still works to this day. By the way, even though they say blog networks don't work, they do. And uh, I ranked for everything around the name of the product the product plus bonus, the product plus bonuses, you know, everything. And then I went on YouTube and I made all these videos and I had 18 out of the top 20 spaces for all of the searches for the product name, the product name plus bonus, etc. On YouTube, uh, I did AdWords ads, I bought email lists, I did uh, PPV, the, you know, the pay-per-view or CPV, they call it, where you can appear over other things on certain sites. I did uh, retargeting. I mean, I did Facebook. I just like everything. I, that 14 page business plan had just a ridiculous number of different ways to go after people who already had traffic. And so I don't remember how many opt ins 
I had, but it was thousands and thousands of opt-ins. I, I built a webinar. Also, I hired a programmer guy because I didn't know how to do this. But um, the site that I was promoting, the, I asked the affiliate manager, I said, can I have my opt-ins that I send to your site? Because I want to email them and market to them. And he said, no, we're not, we're not doing that. So I built a, um, a front-end overlay site that basically spoofed the site for the people who were, you know, who, whose product I was selling. And then people would register for the webinar and I'd send them on to the other site. But I, that other site was effectively my site and it would register them with me at the same time it would register them with the guy. And then that allowed me to send them emails that were way better than the canned affiliate emails that this guy was sending. So, and it also, I put my phone number on everything. So I got, I think I sold like 120 some people on the phone because I put my phone number on every site that I put up on every email that I sent on everything. And people were just blown away. They were like, Oh my God, I never been able to talk to a human being. And by talking to them, I would literally say, you know, well, is this something that you feel is right for you? And they, they would say, yeah, I think it is. And I'd say, okay, well, are you in front of your computer? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, okay, we'll open up the site right here. And then I'd walk them through for six days. I mean, I took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of phone calls and, um, and it was just my cell phone. And then that personal relationship that I created with those people also allowed me to have feedback and know what they wanted that I wasn't currently offering. So like I'd say, I'd be talking to him and I'd say, so is this something you think you're going to, well, I'm thinking about you and I'm thinking about this other guy. And you know, he's got this thing, uh, Google places bonus is the one that I remember the best. And I think it was, uh, Lemoyne, I can't remember his first name. He's a really nice guy, but I was competing with him and I was like, well, that's Mike Lemoyne. That's his name. I said, well, uh, you know, I've got a Google places thing as well. I wasn't going to announce it yet. I had no Google places thing. And now I'm like, okay, well, I've now I've got, I've obviously got to make one. I was like, but I'm, I'm going to let you know that that is a bonus that I'm going to add in. And so, you know, in talking to them, he's like, oh, well, if you're going to do that and you've got all the other stuff, then I'm definitely going with you. And I'm like, absolutely fantastic. Let's get you signed up. So having that one-on-one direct feedback allowed me to evolve my offer to be the best thing that served the market. And I think that's something that as digital marketers, we can miss out on a lot is we think that you know, our communication is all from behind the screen and not being multimodal, I think, not actually talking to your customers can really present an opportunity for a competitor to take advantage of that and actually have a conversation and tailor the product much more to their needs and allow somebody like me to come out of nowhere and be able to, you know, to really t- to grab a hold of something. I think there's, I mean, the whole process there is just kind of overwhelming because a lot of people want something or they say they want something. And then you see a lot of advertisements and marketing around how easy it is to achieve certain results, right? And then I hear what you just described, the efforts you had to put into this. And I'm like, I don't think people would even be willing to put in to do even one aspect of that in a lot of ways. Not everybody, of course, but I think there's a lot of people that would just be like confronted with that. And number one, trying to figure it out on their own. Well, no way. Let's just assume that. But let's say they even have the roadmap. It's like, okay, we're going to do AdWords. We're going to buy an email list. We're going to do PPV. We're going to do retargeting. We're going to do Facebook ads. We're going to do partnerships. We're going to hire a developer to build this front end kind of widget. Like all these things, like, man, pick one of those. People would be like, I feel like a lot of people would just be burned out by it after a day. So what I'm particularly interested with you is how did you actually approach this problem set? And like, how do you actually process, say, like the problem? And what are the things you ask yourself to discover what are different like avenues and different approaches you can take? And then like, maybe walk us through kind of like how you then like execute something, especially if you're not, you haven't really maybe done it before. Like, I don't know if you had done retargeting ads before, if you had done these other things. I had not. I hadn't done really any of it except SEO. So the way that I like to approach something is, is to say, what is the outcome that I am looking to achieve? In this case, uh, it was, I want to sell a bunch of this guy's product as an affiliate. Then I'm going to say, okay, well, what are the things that I need to do that? What are the pieces that will get me to the outcome that I want? In this case, it was, I need an offer, I need traffic, and I need to figure out how to send those people to that place and be able to stay in touch with them so that I can so that I can be sure that, you know, that I'm the one that's going to get credit. So then I say, okay, well, let's look at traffic. Okay, well, where, who already has the customers that I want? This is a question I ask every single time in every deal that I go into. When you're thinking about scaling a company, to me, I always would rather find a place, find a pool of customers that already exist that someone else has 
than to go out and have to win every single customer in individual transactions. So that's leverage, right? So I'm looking for those leverage points. So in this case, I said, okay, well, there are other people that already have lists of customers that trust them. So that's a place for me to go. That's a straight affiliate JV kind of deal. Now, I'd never done an affiliate JV deal like that before on a launch, but I certainly, you know, it's not, I had done lots of JV type things uh, and I had done partnerships before. And it's as simple as saying, you know, hey, uh, now what also helps is like if you were to call the digital marketer guys up and you didn't have any relationship with them, then they would probably not be interested in doing a deal with you, right? So all of this comes out of a base of relationship building capital. And that relationship building is really critical, I think, to doing anything. So if I didn't have any relationships at all, the first thing I would do before I did anything was go out and try to develop some in the industry or niche that I was trying to get into. Because then I can reach out to those people and have a conversation with them. And I end every conversation with everybody I talk to with, is there anything I can do to help you? And it's not a platitude. It's an actual, tell me if there's something I can do. And if they say, well, I've always wanted to get connected to so-and-so, I will immediately connect them with that person if I know them when I get off the phone, or I'll try to make it happen for them or anything that people tell me they need. I'm always asking and I'm always trying to help without expecting anything in return. So that's my, you know, that's a big base foundation to have. I think before you go into anything is that you've got to get out from behind the screen and network and build relationships and relationships can be built, not based on money. They can just be built on being helpful. Right? So that's the first thing. So now I've got, okay, I want, I want to try to go to these people who have audiences so that I can do a joint venture with them. And so then I just reach out because I already know them because I've helped them before or they're in the mastermind or whatever. And I said, you know, this is something I'm doing. Is it something that you'd be interested in doing? I'm going to do all the work. And um, all I need you to do is to send some emails to your audience. If you've got some time on your promo calendar, is that something you'd be interested in? And, you know, maybe 50% of the people that I asked said, oh man, I'd love to, but I've got something else or no, I'm not interested at all. Uh, or maybe, but then enough said yes, that I had you know, 30 odd percent of my sales be able to come from those kinds of things. So that doesn't take a whole lot of skill or effort. And I know Jason Fladlin has done over a hundred million in sales from those exact kinds of things. He doesn't like building audiences, but he loves creating great offers. So he's, he's taken that model and, you know, created a, a whole lot of uh, income and relationships from it. So that's the first thing. And then as I look, then I do that same thing with every other potential source. In this case, I was talking about sources of traffic. So one was people who already have the list. Who else already has my customers? Google does because Google's got all these people out there looking for stuff. So how can I get that? And if I didn't already know how to do SEO, then I'd go to somebody like Lauren Baker, or one of the guys that's really good at um, Lauren's at Search Engine Journal, one of the guys that does that kind of stuff. And I'd hire them to do it because to create something like that isn't terribly expensive and um, is ridiculously effective. And I did the same thing with retargeting was just pretty easy. If you, I mean, if you can take a digital marketer course on retargeting, you can do retargeting. If you can't, you can go on Fiverr. Like, let's say you don't know how to create a Facebook pixel and how to put it on a site, on a page, and then do the retargeting. You can go to Fiverr or something like that and get somebody that can do that stuff for you. For the webinar programmer thing, um, I just reached out to my network and I said, who can program uh, something like this? I'm looking for somebody to do it. And they were like, well, this guy, uh, Sam, Sam would be great to do it. So I call Sam up and I say, Hey man, can you do this for me? And he's like, yeah. I said, what are you going to charge me? He said, he said, I don't know, man, you've helped me a lot uh, before. If you, uh, if you, if you do it, I'll, I'll uh, do it for, I think it was 500 bucks or something like that. So it was just, it's always to me looking at who has the customers that I already want. And then what tool do I need to get to those customers? And then how can I create a relationship with the person who has those customers that will allow them to come to me? And we do that 
over and over and over. We've done it with uh, Infusionsoft and Microsoft, you know, uh, deals with those guys where they already have the customers we want, but they want something from the customers that they've got that they're not getting right now, you know, for example, turning them into a lead for a specific type of campaign. And we'll say, well, how about if we create the campaign for you? We'll create this complete content campaign that gets this giant pool of customers that are customers without a specific interest in the eyes of those software companies. And we'll create interest through a content marketing campaign around a a particular thing that they want. And then we'll generate leads for them that are segments of their existing lead lists. And they pay us to do that plus share the leads, meaning that all the leads that come in from those campaigns, we have as well as them to market our stuff to. And we've built a relationship with those leads because the content was created by us with our people. So, and, and it's like those people, you know, to have Microsoft wrap its arm around you and say, I'm with, I'm with digital marketer and they're good. That's a pretty cool thing. This is very interesting to me. So you've done this at really every level here because you were just talking about the, you know, individual, yes. like working with like individual influencers, bloggers, you know, solopreneurs up, up to the you know, biggest company in the world and still taking the same framework, yep. right? What you're describing. Yeah, it, it works all along. I mean, and you got to think about it. It's like you find out what somebody wants who has something you want and you help them get it in a way that gets you what you want too. It, that's the ultimate simplicity of it. And the leverage that you get from that is just spectacular. So with when you approach things like this, I guess the other question I have kind of tied in with this is how do you decide which opportunities are the ones you're going to pursue? (laughs) You know, it's more of deciding the opportunities we're not going to pursue because Mm -hmm. you have to say no to the okay deals and the little deals to get the once in a lifetime deal that I've determined comes along two or three times a year. So like really, if you think about it, if you fill up your plate with a bunch of stuff, because you're trying to fill up your plate with stuff, and then some fantastic opportunity comes along, you either won't have the capacity or resources or bandwidth to deal with that thing, to do that new deal, or you'll do it badly and ruin a relationship, or you won't even realize what a great opportunity it is because you're so in the weeds of everything else. So the way I look at it is, you know, my criteria of a deal to do now is it's got to be worth about $10 million to us within the next two or three years, or we're not going to do it. And that uh, criteria, wherever you set it for you, wherever you are right now, you know, in your life, I think is really critical. And it, it provides a great filter of what to do and what not to do. The second thing that we then layer on top of that is we have, I, I created an Excel spreadsheet it's called the Growth Opportunity Scorecard and the, uh, the Growth Idea Opportunity Scorecard. And the, what we do with that is at each of our different companies, we sit down with our growth team. We have a growth team that's typically about five different people in each company. And we sit down and we list all of the different ideas that we're going to, that we're considering. And then part of that is we have an, a hypothesis that's listed that says, we believe if we do X then Y will occur and we'll know when Z happens. That's our hypothesis. If we can't say that, we can't answer that, then it's not really a good idea because we, we won't be able to know if it works and we won't know what will have happened if it does work. So that's the first thing. Then we go and we run it through. Is it going to move one of the five growth levers? Is it going to uh, help with acquisition of new customers or activation of existing customers with monetization to get more money, with causing existing customers to stay longer, retention, or with referrals to other people. So acquisition, activation, monetization, retention, referral. If it's not moving one of those five growth levers, then we're not going to do it. And then after we look at those growth levers, we say, okay, well, this passed test one, it's got a hypothesis that works. It passed test two, it's going to move one of the five growth levers or more. Then we go through an ICE analysis and we say, what's the impact, the likelihood of the, excuse me, what is the impact this will have on our business? Is it going to move the needle, you know, a whole lot or just a little? And what's our confidence that this will actually work? And how easy is it? ICE, right? Impact, confidence, and ease. Now that's a one to 10 rating that we put on it. And then 
all of those ideas are in the spreadsheet now, this Excel spreadsheet. And we say, okay, well, this quarter, we want to focus on customer acquisition. Great. So then we sort the ideas by the score of what scored the best. First, it's every everything that actually is going to have an acquisition growth lever. So if it was helping with retention and referral, we're not doing that because our focus is on acquisition this quarter. Then all of those ideas that are acquisition movers now get sorted by ICE, impact, confidence, and ease. And so we know which one will have the greatest impact with the greatest confidence with the least amount of effort. And that's the thing we do next. Wow. That is just a complete system. I love that. Did you guys develop that organically? Is this something that came from your, your days in kind of the, the banking space, investment banking or what? Uh, it kind of just came up organically with, with mostly with me and Ryan and Richard. Yeah. That's awesome. No, that's fantastic. Okay, great. Have you seen that people can use a, a model like this even at a lower, lower level, we'll say, without, without a team? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it all it does is, you know, when I when I speak, I say, I, you know, I'll talk about this. And I say, you know, how many of you go, come to an event like this, because they're all at an event I'm speaking at, right? So how many of you people come to an event like this and take pages and pages of notes and then go home and look at them and go, holy crap, that's so much work. I'm going to walk the dog, right? It's mm -hmm. easy to get overwhelmed and not know what to do if you don't have a system for prioritizing what you're going to do. And this allows you to do that at the individual level or at the enterprise level. Mm, yep. Great advice. And I, I look at something like that and say, that's it. It's like, I think a lot of people get overwhelmed. Prioritization, overwhelm, and just the re reality that I think a lot of the stuff is a lot of work. If it's worthwhile, I find that yeah, you, there's always shortcuts you can say, but that doesn't, the shortcut doesn't mean it's easier. A shortcut is often harder to implement. I've exactly. found, you know, it's like, yeah, you're doing land navigation and it's like, yeah, the shortest or the shortcut is going to be over that mountain, but maybe you want to walk around it because it takes a little bit longer. But if you want to get there faster, you know, over the mountain, it sounds like that's kind of some of the things you kind of look at conceptually. It is. And so then I'm going to say, okay, over the mountains faster, who's got a plane? Yep. Right. Exactly. That I can that I can ride on. And that's I'm looking for the plane that I can ride on. Do you think that a lot of people and, and this is this is a broad base question. So when I say a lot of people, uh, so let me strike that and say, do you feel that when you interact with entrepreneurs that do you ever get the sense that many will focus in on what well, so let's say they they are are solving a problem and they're using some, you know, some of the methodology you just described. And they know, okay, this is the thing I want to achieve. They can create a hypothesis around it. But then maybe what they do is they zoom in on some aspect of it and then they try to do it all themselves. Do you feel like that's a common occurrence among entrepreneurs to kind of like get too honed in on like the doing it themselves and that they should look for other ways to not only leverage like a certain strategy, but leverage other people too, whether that's hiring a team, getting, you know, hiring specific contractors. What, what's your thoughts on that? Absolutely. It, it goes to my philosophy of how to be happy. Mm. And you, you'll never be happy if you're trying to do everything yourself. And so when we're entrepreneurs and we're, you know, starting out and we, we're kind of a one person team uh, or a two person team, the tempting thing to do is to say, well, I'll do it myself because I don't have the money. Uh, or I don't have the resources to get somebody else to do it. And I think the the way around that is to to partner. And so I have throughout my life always partnered with people. I've never done something that's a hundred percent by myself because I don't want to do all of the things and I'm not the best qualified person to do the other things. So if I'm going into you know if I'm going into a new business, let's say I'm going to go into an ecom business and um, I'm good at sourcing products, but I'm not good at Amazon or I'm good at Amazon and I'm not good at sourcing products. Then I'm going to go and find the best person that I can to partner with who will do the other stuff that I'm not good at or that I don't like. And I think my, my partnership with Brian and Perry and Rich is, is really perfect as an example because Perry is an amazing startup guy. I absolutely hate startups. I think that the momentum required to start something up isn't ever worth the time, the momentum that it takes to go just go and buy something or partner with somebody that's already got it going. And But Perry's really good at that startup thing. And Ryan is amazing at building teams and culture. And Rich is amazing at operating. And Ryan is a great face of a company who likes creating all of that content and being out there in front of the public, which isn't my favorite thing to do, right? So as a strategist who can scale and exit businesses, I'm a good fit for them 
because I've got those skills that they don't have. And I'm happy because I don't want to do any of that stuff that they're doing. And they actually love doing the stuff they're doing and would hate doing the stuff I'm doing. You know, so like that's, I think the answer to your question is that the temptation is great to try to be everything in your business and wear all the hats, but you absolutely do not have to. If you have the money, you can hire the people to do that. If you don't have the money, you can partner with the people to do that. And if you have the money, you can also partner with people while hiring people. And you end up with this great combination of contractors, employees, and partners that helps you to build a way bigger company that you could ever build by yourself. Roland, I love it, man. I could talk for hours about this. I really appreciate kind of your insights into like, getting inside your brain a little bit to see how it kind of operates and thinks because I think you have a unique take on an approach to business. And I thought that was really fascinating with our first conversation when we first met and just seeing how you kind of look at things. You really, and you, you practice what you preach. When you talk about these levers, you know, you talk about like this kind of systematic way to approach a specific problem and solve it. It's like, and then to see it in practice is always remarkable. So I really appreciate you taking the time today to share that with us. Where can people reach out to find you, connect with you and learn more about you? The easiest place for me personally would be rolandfraser.com, R-O-L-A-N-D-F-R-A-S-I-E-R.com. And then um, our company's digitalmarketer.com or platter, P-L-A-T-T-R.com or uh, the warroommastermind.com. Any, any of those places, I'm, I'm all of those places and on Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram as well. Awesome. Well, Roland, thank you so much for being on In the Trenches with us today. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Are you trying to grow your online business, but struggling to get new customers consistently and predictably? Are you tired of working nonstop only to see your income plateau? Are you ready to step off the hustle hamster wheel, as I call it, and step onto a path of predictable profit that you can scale as much or as little as you want? Don't worry, you're not alone. I've been there. When I first got started, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I started reading blogs and listening to podcasts by people I respected and wanted to learn from. I slowly but surely put their recommendations into practice. But because I wanted to do it all myself, maybe you, you're you something like that, right? You love to do, do it by yourself, learn through trial and error. Well, bottom line is it took forever. Results were unpredictable when I was first getting started. I wasn't sure where to spend my time, money, and energy. And shiny penny syndrome got the best of me on more than one occasion. For many entrepreneurs, the amount I sacrificed, working literally nonstop in some cases in my spare time, and 12 and 14 hour days routinely after going full time, combined with the endless fog of war, aka that uncertainty that I had to deal with at all times because I was going it alone. I think that would have been enough for most entrepreneurs to throw in the towel. But I was persistent, focused, and I stayed humble. Day after day, I worked to grow the traffic to my website, increase my list of subscribers, and generate a healthy living for my ebooks, e courses, and other digital products. At least that was the goal. But maybe more important than the work, was that I paid attention to what I was doing, including what worked and what didn't. Eventually, I discovered a predictable pattern of growth. And so what I did was I just doubled down on those things, and I scrapped or sidelined the other things that weren't working so well. Finally, two years after resigning my commission as a captain in the army and going full-time on my online business front with my blog, with my podcast, etc., I replaced my income with digital product income. Two years. And so if that's where it stopped, I would have been happy with it. I would have been happy with the results. I wouldn't have complained. I would have been very content just replacing my income. But the bottom line is it was so much work. I wanted to, you know, see if it could go somewhere else, right? So I just kept doing what I was doing, but better, faster, more effectively. Again, just kind of applying the same system that I discovered uh, from seeing these patterns emerge, right? So I implemented it. I kept doing it. And eventually replacing my income turned into doubling my income. And then that turned into a little bit more and a little bit more. But not just that, it afforded me the freedom to dictate my day and also choose the projects I want to work on, on the schedule and on the timeline I want, and to work with the people I want to work with. And to me, that's like a whole new level of freedom, especially coming from the military. It's something I've never really had that level of complete autonomy until I became my own boss. I started my own business. And until ultimately, until it became profitable enough for me to start to take a step back and actually reap the rewards of it. Because it's not all just working, working, working. And I do believe it's hard work. And I'll always say that nothing about doing this stuff is easy. But at the same time, you've got to reap the rewards at some point and take some of that profit, uh, even if you're just reinvesting it into new assets and things like that. Bottom line is, it can't just be work, right? Entrepreneurship and business is about that result that occurs, the value you've created, and the profit that 
that piece of value that you've captured, okay? And you want to be able to reap the rewards of that profit, of that value, of that little sliver of value that you get to capture, that you get to net, right? You want to be able to take advantage of that. Otherwise, you know, the entrepreneurship game really does become just a grind. And, and for, I think, a lot of entrepreneurs, unfortunately, it becomes meaningless, and that's when they quit. Well, for me, I love this stuff. I really, truly do. I mean, it is my thing. And so that's why I didn't just stop where I was at. I've stayed committed to learning everything I can about all aspects of this online business world and this online marketing world. And I do this through real world application. In other words, I'm currently growing several online businesses and I'm always putting my ideas to the test in real time with my own money, with my own time and energy, oftentimes with employees, you know, a lot of some, some stuff more advanced, some stuff more simple, but you know, so varying levels of complexity and again, in different spaces, different niches. And I can say, you know, bottom line, I've always loved the startup hustle, but I got to say, it's nice to now be in a position where I can get big results with much less effort, thanks to having built the foundation of my business the right way. And again, I did it all through trial and error, but I don't think that that's the way that everyone needs to do it. And in fact, looking back on it, if I had to redo it, I don't know if I would. It was so difficult to just go it alone and try to figure everything out by myself. So one of the things I've tried to do is give back with this podcast, with my blog, and with my newsletter. But maybe even more rewarding than any of this stuff, while I've enjoyed all of it, I think the thing that I'm enjoying the most, that I find most engaging and rewarding, is the premium business mastermind and coaching program I run called 100K Academy. Inside 100K Academy, I help ambitious entrepreneurs who are very driven and excited to be doing what they're doing. I help them grow their reach, their influence, and their profit using my proprietary marketing system. That's the same one I use to scale my own online businesses from zero to multiple six figures and beyond, and the same system I use to help my clients reach the New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestseller list, set Kickstarter funding records, and create viral product launches that have turned into predictable revenue streams. So lots and lots of case studies that you can find at tommorcus.com. If you're curious, just go to tommorcus.com slash about, and that'll get you started. Most importantly, this system is one that 100K Academy members and alumni have used to achieve tremendous results, like Alexa who used it to have her most profitable year ever, or Tina, who used it to make five figures from a sales funnel that she can now replicate and scale, and that's exactly what she's doing, or Carrie, who made over $75,000 in just seven days. And the crazy part about his story was that his online business was actually a side hustle up until that first profitable launch, which he has then been able to grow and scale. And he subsequently quit his job following that very successful week. And I think that that has been just a game changer for Carrie and the life he's living and the work he gets to do and the impact he gets to make on the world because of the great work he's doing now, because he was able to figure out a system that would get him the targeted traffic, the subscribers, the sales to grow a profitable online business. Bottom line, if you want to grow your online business from six to seven figures, but you flatlined or you're struggling, or you just want to be told what to do and when to do it and in what order, right? And you want a system that is predictable and scalable and isn't just you know another shiny penny, but actually will fit right into your business. It plugs in and is something that you can truly grow. I want you to go to tommorcus.com slash academy. That's tommorcus.com slash academy. Academy is spelled A-C-A-D-E-M-Y. Go to tommorcus.com slash academy and you'll find a page on my website with more details about 100K Academy, the business mastermind coaching program I run, as well as instructions on what to do next. Again, that's tomworkus.com slash academy. And if you're serious about growing your reach, influence, or profit, just follow the instructions and we'll be in touch, okay? Again, tomworkus.com slash academy. Go ahead and head over there.